this we count on Wednesday, even though, well, the debris tracker project has to do with counting, and so does Eterna to an extent. But I thought it was like a fun play on words um, because a lot of citizen science projects have to do with numbers, um, including the ones we're doing today, and because we all count because we're doing citizen science and making a difference. Yeah, that was a good name. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great, great, great. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Caroline Nickerson and I'm with the SciStarter team. Um, we are currently live on YouTube, so just keep that in mind. But um, because I know that uh, we want this to be interactive and we want this to be fun for you, if you have a question, put that in the chat. We'll be monitoring the chat this whole time. Um, if you really want to um, engage with dialogue for, with us, we're going to have um, some time at the end where I can turn your audio and video on if you want to verbally ask a question. Right now, you all are in webinar mode, um, so you're just kind of in watch mode, but we urge you to um, chime in in the chat. I'm also turning on my phone so I can make sure I don't miss any of your chats. Um, but we urge you to chime in on the chat and um, be super active today because we want to hear from you. This event is for you. I also want to thank um, my co-host, Kimmy Majors from the St. Charles Public Library. Um, for those of you who are actually based in St. Charles, Illinois, I am jealous of you because you all have an amazing library. Um, to get things kicked off, though, I'm just going to share my screen. And um, as you can see, welcome St. Charles. We are here um, as a SciStarter event. SciStarter stands for science we can do together. We're starting the science and we're all focused on citizen science. But before we get into that, we're gonna do some quick polls just to kick things off and figure out who's in the room with us. So please, um, let's see, let's do this poll. So we wanna know, have you ever participated in a citizen science project before? And please vote, get those votes in. I have, so I am voting yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, host and panelists can't vote. So you all have to vote for us. Let us know. Looks like we have three yeses so far, two noes. That's totally okay. If your answer is no, you will know how to do a citizen science project by the end of this event and you'll be able to get started. For those of you who say yes, I'd love to know what projects you've done. That's super interesting. Um, okay. So looks like we have four yeses, two noes. Totally okay. We're going to go ahead and end the poll there and share those results so y'all can see it. Awesome, awesome. Um, then we have one more poll. We want to know who you are. So if you could kindly tell us, are you an aspiring citizen scientist? Are you a parent of an aspiring citizen scientist? Are you a teacher, an educator, a troop leader, etc.? Are you a librarian or part of a library staff? Are you a researcher or a project leader? Are you just a bored person on the internet? That's okay too. Are you a patron of the St. Charles Library? Are you none of these? Um, please select all that apply. We have a few bored people on the internet. That's so funny. I hope that this event entertains you and you aren't bored for too long. Um, we have some teachers in the room with us, some educators, we have some library staff members, some researchers. We got quite a few aspiring citizen scientists in the room with us today. Um, keep those votes coming in. We'll leave this up just for one more second so you're able to vote. Um, okay, three, two, one, and I am gonna end the poll. We'll share those results. So as you can see, the majority of you are aspiring citizen scientists. Um, we got some educators, some library staff members, researchers, some bored people on the internet. You are all welcome here today. We're glad you're here. All right, let's go to our next slide. So here, um, Kimmy is going to um, present for us today about what's happening at the St. Charles Public Library. Kimmy, take it away. Hello. So yes, I'm Kimmy Majors and I'm the volunteer coordinator at the St. Charles Public Library. And right now we have a lot of things going on with the library. We're underway of our construction, our renovation of our library, which is about halfway done. Um, it's expected to end hopefully by the end of summer of next year, so 2021. You can go to our website and see all of the updates and some pictures. And we actually have a really cool live camera that you can see um, exactly what's going on today. Um, um, so right now that's there. We are in a temporary location at the Haynes Middle School, which is not too far from there. Um, you can come in now by appointment only. And actually we just heard recently that probably next week um, they might lift that and you can just, you don't need to make an appointment to come in and browse. 
And we do have services, limited services, notary, if you need to use a computer lab, um, all of our reference librarians are, are here and ready to help you. Um, if you don't want to come into the library, but you'd like to check out some books, we have a great service where you can call and put some books on hold. And you can pick them up in the vestibule. So you don't even need to come into the library, um, but you do need to make an appointment for picking those up. Um, we have a ton of virtual programs right now that are set up and in the future for you know adults, uh, children, all ages, uh, computer programs, youth programs. Um, yeah, so check our website if you um, are interested in any of those. Hope you join. So right now, being that our, we're in a temporary location and um, space is limited, our on-site volunteer program is not what it was before. So we really wanna still keep our volunteers engaged and involved with the library. So we were very excited when we learned about citizen science and when we partnered with SciStarter.org and thank you to Caroline and SciStarter for making this all happen today and then our next event tomorrow. Um, but this is just a great way for students, the patrons, the community, and we're asking our staff, you know, to get involved. Um, students can earn volunteer credit uh, for school if they need to do that. Um, it's great for families. I know personally, my two younger children, we've gotten um, started on a couple of projects where we're out taking pictures of bugs and trees and it's been a lot of fun. Um, it's been a lot of fun. So we encourage everybody to, to get involved with, with us and, you know, get on site starter and find some project that interests you. Thank you, Caroline. Awesome. Thank you, Kimmy. Um, and Kimmy already kind of summarized this a little bit, um, but if you all need her contact info, we'll also include that in the notes from these events. Um, and as Kimmy mentioned, there are two events in this series this week. So the event you're in today, either if you're tuning in on YouTube, awesome. If you're with us in the Zoom room, also great. Um, and then we also have an event tomorrow, which is um, at, uh, I believe, 8 o'clock my time, 7 o'clock your time. I'm based in Florida, so I get to, to virtually join you in St. Charles, Illinois. And for those of you who aren't library patrons, um, I urge you to get in, uh, of St. Charles Public Library. I urge you to get involved with your local library. Libraries are rapidly becoming hubs for citizen science, and the St. Charles Public Library is a great example of that community leadership. And um, Kimmy, you're going to hear more about this later in this event, but Kimmy um, took the initiative to make a SciStarter list of projects that she thought would be a great fit for her patrons. Um, so she put together those volunteer opportunities and she's able to keep track of um, the statistics for participation. So for the number and frequency of contributions all on SciStarter. Um, so that's something that she's running a program that she's putting together um, at St. Charles and for your local library, you might be able to do that too. And someone uh, put in the chat, this is awesome. They've done quite a few citizen science projects. They did Coco Raws, which is a precipitation or rain monitoring project, as well as they've monitored singing insects and odonate. Super interesting, cool stuff. So for those of you who hadn't done citizen science before, you might be wondering, what is citizen science anyway? Well, at SciStarter, we tend to um, define it as a collaboration between scientists and those of us who are curious, concerned, and motivated to make a difference. So it's basically any way a member of the public, no matter your age, you could be nine years old, you could be 100 years old, um, it's a way a member of the public is able to volunteer their time to move science forward. And this can be submitting data. This can be conducting analysis. Um, you could submit that data by taking pictures of plants and animals around you to help scientists understand the geographic distribution of different species. It could be by monitoring the water quality of your local lake to figure out if the water there is safe. That's citizen science. It could be, um, as you'll learn about later today, it could be playing a game online to help design new medicines by solving puzzles. Citizen science is so diverse. It, it encompasses every field of science. Um, the thing it has in common is it needs you. It, citizen science, um, these researchers need your help to do the research. They literally can't accomplish it without you and the power of the crowd. And on SciStarter, we are that connector. We connect 
you to the science science projects that need your help. Um, but it can be a little overwhelming at times. There are thousands of projects, events, tools listed on SciStarter, you may think, oh my gosh, I don't even know where to start. Well, that's why people like Kimmy create things like lists on SciStarter. I'm going to put this link in the chat as well. But if you go to SciStarter.org um, forward slash list forward slash 813, you'll be able to discover some projects that Kimmy picked out as being a particularly good fit for you. And not, of all, not all of those projects are SciStarter affiliates. So it's a little complicated, but bear with me. Um, there are, uh, out of the thousands of projects listed on SciStarter, there are about a hundred of them that have opted to go the extra mile to allow people to track the number and the frequency of their contributions on their SciStarter dashboard. So what does that mean? It means that when you make a SciStarter account and you can actually make your SciStarter account on this web link, um, on this page right here that Kimmy made for you, you can make a SciStarter account. And when you make your SciStarter account, so whatever email you use, um, when you go off and do a project somewhere else, so for example, the projects you're learning about today that we spotlighted for this event, Eterna and Debris Tracker, you have to go somewhere else. So for Debris Tracker, you download an app, and for Eterna, you make an account on their website, um, and you have to create login information there. And if you make your account with the same email address you use to make your SciStarter account, your contributions to these projects will track in your SciStarter dashboard. So you'll be able to go into your SciStarter dashboard and review across a bunch of different projects. Oh my gosh, I contributed five times on this day to that project. You'll be able to get those high level summary statistics because these are SciStarter affiliates. And on Kimmy's end, she'll be able to know, oh my gosh, I got this many people to contribute this much to these different projects. And she's actually able, because I know she she's working with a number of students on volunteer hours, she's able to estimate the hours because for, for Eterna, it usually takes about, I would say, like five minutes or so to make a contribution. So she can, um, let's say a student has made 20 contributions, she could multiply 20 by five, and then she has the number of minutes estimated that that student contributed, and she can give them volunteer service time credit. I urge you to explore all the projects, events, and tools listed on SciStarter. You'll definitely find something that piques your interest, be it spiral galaxies, or the, the night sky, or um, health research, or um, plants, different plants and animals. You'll find something that interests you that you can study with citizen science and help move the world forward. But if you want a good place to start, and especially if you're in St. Charles in Illinois, we urge you guys to go to SciStarter.org forward slash list forward slash 183 to make your SciStarter account and discover some projects that have been picked out just for you to get you started. Um, and if you want to minimize this Zoom window and go ahead and make your account right now, I won't stop you. I think that's a great idea. We'd love for you all to make your accounts. Um, also on this list page is the Introduction to Citizen Science module. It's at the very bottom of the page. You can click through it to learn the, the what, the how, the who, and the why of citizen science. You can go at your own pace, and this is an interactive module. So there are quizzes, there are videos, and at the very end you get a certificate. And it's um, a super accessible module. We wrote it at a fifth grade reading level, so it could appeal to people of different ages from um, students to adults. Um, so if you have a friend or family member or somebody in your life that you'd like to introduce to citizen science, you can send them that list URL. So SciStarter.org forward slash list forward slash 183. And you can have them do this module. And it'd be a super easy way to make sure they get a good lay of the land for citizen science. Um, so our first project that we're featuring today, I know I mentioned that, that citizen science is so diverse and there are so many different ways to be involved. We thought we'd start you off with one of my favorite projects, Eterna, which is a game where you solve puzz puzzles to literally invent medicine. And I thought this project was particularly relevant um, because right now they're trying to create a coronavirus vaccine and look into the possibilities of doing that. So I'm going to quickly stop sharing my screen so I can make sure I share this, um, the sound. So let me share my screen again. We'll share computer sound. All right, so we're going to watch this video to get us started. We're going to turn the sound on. It's a puzzle solving game that reveals the mysteries of one of the most powerful molecules in biology, RNA. RNA is the companion of DNA, taking genetic information and putting it to work inside our cells by folding into complex structures. Smart RNA 
has the potential to transform medicine, tackling some of the most prevalent and deadly diseases on the planet, like tuberculosis, malaria, and cancer. But scientists don't fully understand its behavior. That's where Eterna comes in. Players use the four nucleotides that make up RNA to design a pattern that forms into a target shape. As they progress, the puzzles become more complex and the challenges reflect the mechanics of nature. After gaining experience, players reach the lab, where their designs are manufactured and tested at Stanford University, often tens of thousands at a time. The experimental results are then returned to the players so they can improve their designs and become scientific collaborators, joining professional scientists on the frontiers of biochemistry. Oh my gosh, so exciting. So just to review with Eterna, you are inventing medicine. So you're solving puzzles, which help you design molecular medicines. Then you get feedback from real experiments at Stanford School of Medicine. After that, you can work together with those researchers to write papers for scientific peer review. And you can propose your own puzzles to advance research and invent medicine, literally invent medicine. That's so exciting to me. Um, so let's see. I think before we watch another video, um, we had one of the researchers join us recently at SciStarter. I'm going to show you how you could discover Eterna and participate on your own. So let's say I'm a patron of the St. Charles Library. And I go to SciStarter.org forward slash list forward slash 183. Oh my gosh, here it is. Here's some info about the events. This is the event we're all in right now. This is the event tomorrow. So we urge you all to register tomorrow so you can um, keep the fun going and learn about even more of these projects. And there's one of the featured projects, Eterna. Um, library volunteer notes, what did Kimmy want us to know? She said, Teams and Up need smart internet, medium level. That's good to know. And if I want a refresher on citizen science later, I have this tutorial here as well that I can explore at my leisure. So I'm going to click to Eterna. Um, there are some more details about how to get involved that I can read later if I need extra help. But then I can all already go over and participate. So it's loading. Give it a second. Um, so when you click register, make sure you register with your SciStarter um, email. So whatever email you use to create your SciStarter account, use that email to register on Eterna so everything will track in the back end. It's also available on the App Store or Google Play, but I really like playing it on the computer. And just because we're demoing it today, we're going to play the demo really quick. The puzzles get a lot harder than what you're about to see here. <laughs> um, they get increasingly complex uh, because you're actually designing real medicine and you're matching all these um, these nucleotides. Um, and you don't need to know every single detail of the science to be able to make an impact. You just have to be good at matching things and solving puzzles. So you may have played games on your phone before, like, I don't know, I don't really play games on my phone. I'm too busy doing these citizen science projects. But I think Candy Crush are like hidden gem puzzle games. If you're really good at those types of things, you'll probably like Eterna. So this is a game where you become an RNA scientist. You can solve puzzles that will help invent new RNA molecules to combat infections, infectious diseases and more. Are you ready? Click next to continue. So this is RNA, good to know. That's a single base and that's a paired base. So for this puzzle, you must make five or more bases blue. Tap on a base to change or mutate it to blue and watch the counter above increase. When it reaches five and the border changes from red to green, you've solved the puzzle. So we're gonna turn some bases blue. Oh, it gave me some encouraging, great pairing. What if I do this one? Also a great pairing. Wow. Exciting, I've unlocked the undo tool. RNA is made up of four bases. The blue base is uracil. The yellow base is adenine. And some of you actually may know more about this. If any students came, maybe you're in like your biology class right now and you know more about these technical terms. Even though I don't know all the science, like I said, I'm still making a meaningful contribution because I'm solving a puzzle. So now our goal is to have five red bases. Um, so now you're painting with red. 
Let's do it. It's giving me feedback saying great pairing, great pairing. I did it again! Woo! All right, we're gonna get to the next puzzle. I think it's about to get a lot harder. Now they want us to make three or more AU bonds. So yellow to blue. Um, and this is a more realistic simulation. I told you all it was gonna get harder. How, of how RNA actually folds. These are locked bases, they can't be changed. So if there's the key right there, those are locked. And we want to pair up three more A's, yellow, with U's, blue, making nine pairs in total. Okay, that makes sense. All right, so we don't want the unlocked ones, but we want to um, pair some yellow ups with yellows with blues. And it worked! I did what I needed to do. Let's do one more puzzle before I show you a video. I think this is about as hard as we're gonna get today. We can keep on advancing through the levels, of course. All right, so the target mode shows the desired shape. So we really want it to be shaped like that, you know? And we want to see the red parts are not folding properly. The white parts are folding properly. So at the bottom here, we kind of have what we want already, but we need to somehow fix what's going on up top. They want us to make AU base pairs to meet the target shape. So that yellow to um, red. Good luck. All right, let's do this thing. Huh, there we go. Congratulations, you've unlocked the palette. With the palette, you can change any base to whatever kind you like. There are three kinds of bonds. GC bonds are the strongest. AU bonds are weaker. GU bonds are the weakest. Find out which kinds are, which each kind is important. Very cool. So as you can see, as you go through all this, you actually learn a lot about the science. And I mean, that's how these things work, right? We're doing science, we're generating research, we're finding out new things, but we're also learning things along the way. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed that brief preview of Eterna. Um, we're also going to cover Debris Tracker today. Before we move on, I also wanted to sh um, show you a little bit of the people behind Eterna. Um, so we work a lot with that team. They're absolutely amazing. And a few months back, they joined us for an event. See this event. And so uh, I'm just going to show you a short clip from this event so you can see some of the people who are behind Eterna as researchers community in, which we're really grateful for. Um, and we also have the Eterna Project on the line, um, specifically Do Soon Kim, um, a researcher with the Eterna Project, to explain to us how we can do real science. Um, whatever age we are, um, whoever we are, wherever we are in the world, we can participate in this project. So we're going to get started um, with a live see poll. You all have seen that before. I need to switch ahead a little bit more. So let's switch to Do Soon's um, explanation. I thought he did a really great job with that. Public on, on, on their rigor, and then also what we're, we're sort of moving to in the future is um, players coming up with their own scientific hypotheses and being able to test those by making puzzles for other citizen scientists. So we're trying to sort of um, cultivate uh, an ecosystem of citizen scientists that are uh, feeding off of each other, much like what happens with professional scientists. All right, I can go on to the next slide now. Thank you. So just a, a little bit of uh, background on me, so I'm not just a floating head talking to you about this computer game. Um, so, and, and this slide is supposed to show you that citizen scientists and scientists in general can come from any background uh, and have formal training in almost anything. So I got my undergraduate degree in chemical engineering at the University of Texas at Austin, and where I was introduced to a field of research called synthetic biology. And synthetic biology is broadly concerned with um, altering or being able to engineer biological systems from scratch. Uh, I then moved on to graduate work at Northwestern University near Chicago, um, where I studied chemical and biological engineering, mostly focused on the biological engineering part. And my research focus was on uh, this field called directed evolution, which aims to evolve new machines that carry out custom functions. And then it was through this work that I worked on these classes of machines called RNA machines uh, and to back out very, very, very far and let's say to use a, um, I'll, I'll use a library analogy. Um, so uh, 
So in, in biology, there are three sort of core concepts. Um, it's called the central dogma of bio, central dogma of biology, and it goes from DNA to RNA to proteins. So the very central process in biology revolves around this central dogma, where DNA, RNA, and proteins, information sort of flows in that order to achieve a lot of biocatalysis. Um, the analogy that I would make for RNA, so DNA is like the actual library where all the information is held. Yeah, and then RNA is like if you were to go check out a book from that library, and then you absorb that knowledge into you know your your brain or you know your, your ideas, um, and then the protein is essentially you can think of it as what you do with that knowledge from that book that you checked out of the library, right? So RNA solves serves as this sort of messenger molecule in transferring information from a central database like a library to you, um, a citizen scientist who might go and do something with it which is like a protein. So RNA is that sort of middle ground that transfers messages between the central database and uh, your own knowledge database. So from my work on RNA machines at Northwestern, I, um, in light of the COVID pandemic and, and a lot of the efforts on Eterna right now are on designing these vaccines against COVID-19, this pandemic that was, is going on in the world and, and utilizing the power of citizen scientists um, on Eterna to design better mRNA therapeutics, specifically mRNA vaccines to fight SARS-CoV-2, um, the virus. Um, and that position is at Stanford University right now, leading the Open Vaccine Initiative um, on Eterna. You can go to the next slide. Sorry. Thanks. And, and this is an overview of how Eterna works. So for those of you who might not be familiar with RNA, RNA you can think of as just a string of beads, and these beads have identities in them. So what we've done is abstract RNA from this rather complex biomolecule into essentially a string of colors. Um, and there's four colors because there are four different types of beads or nucleotides of RNA. And players can go on eternagame.org and just try out different sequences for a given puzzle. And then it'll form different shapes. And then whenever it reaches a shape that you like or one that is defined by the puzzle, you will submit it. Uh, into a public database and other players, and, and you have votes too, obviously, can go vote on designs they like best. And what you can vote on is totally up to the player, like you would be, a, you know, for a scientist, you can vote because you like the shape a lot, you can vote because you like the color of a lot. There's no hard, fast rule on how you can vote on these molecules. But players do vote, and they discuss amongst themselves very intensely, and a lot of campaigning happens for votes sometimes, you can imagine, so that your designs might get voted. The top, voted um, the top voted designs are then synthesized and uh, experimented upon by scientists at Stanford University. And also we have collaborations at Northwestern University and also other institutions that do experiments on these RNA molecules. So just from the top left to the bottom right, what has happened is an RNA molecule that a citizen scientist designed via a video game on your computer is now being synthesized and um, cutting edge RNA biochemistry experiments are being performed at Stanford University. And what is really unique about Eterna and sort of baked into our structure is that the results of the, um, the experiments on the molecules that you designed as a citizen scientist are not just kept in the vault for professional scientists to work on, they're actually returned back to the players. So over time, you can imagine going around the circle multiple times and becoming iteratively better and better at RNA design as um, the project goes on. And this actually happens quite often. Our, our most veteran players are as good, if not better, at RNA design than, say, me, uh, someone who traditionally formally trained as a, as a scientist in this field. And over time, just like players come up with, you know, crazy good nuanced rules about video games, players on Eterna over time have become um, very apt at uh, coming up with their own language to describe certain shapes, um, having design rules around how certain sequences and, and, and shapes are achieved. Uh, and then now there's sort of this own ecosystem that lives on the Eterna game uh, of these design rules that now exist. So as you can see, that's like a basic introduction of to Eterna, and that was due. Um, and I just really enjoyed. Oops, I think we fixed it. There we go. Um, I just really enjoyed his introduction, and I think he also helped to all this because he's a person behind it, right? And he's helping coordinate the work of thousands of people just like you to design all of this. Um, so I just, I really um, enjoy that video and I hope you did as well. 
And um, he's actually the one who runs pretty much all of their social media accounts. So if you end up tweeting at Eterna, tag SciStarter too. I'm the one who handles a lot of the SciStarter social media. So if you if you tweet or post on Facebook or post on Instagram and tag Eterna or SciStarter, we will definitely reply to you. So you'd hear from me and do soon. Um, next up, we have Debris Tracker, also known as Marine Debris Tracker, but they've broadened it recently. Um, oh, we have a question from somebody. They want to know, how do the puzzles turn into scientific analysis for medicine? I don't understand the correlation. So basically, when you're playing those puzzles, you are actually organizing um, the building blocks of RNA. Um, so you're saying, I want this component of RNA to go here. I want this other component of RNA to go there. And then um, the best um, designs get voted on. And those are sent to Stanford. And then Stanford creates those molecules in the lab. So they, they build it just so. And there are certain types of vaccines that might be RNA-based, like the one they're trying to build for COVID. So they're able to build the vaccine based on the design um, that was created by citizen scientists. Um, someone said, our California Retired Teachers Association's Cal Rita Educational Foundation is crowdfunding one working group with our members to place and promote citizen science kits projects, K through 12, junior college campus, and local community libraries. We've started um, Zoom sessions with her in San Diego County. Thanks for the great St. Charles Library, Jay Kloppelstein. Thanks, Jay. This is awesome. Yeah, we want as many people doing citizen science events as possible. Um, but I hope, Virginia, that answered your question about how the puzzles turn into scientific analysis for medicine, because you're when you're doing the puzzle, you're literally building a molecule. Um, you're, you're basically making the blueprint that then the people at Stanford are able to take in, at, in the lab and then create. Um, so, and it gets harder and harder. I, we did the easy ones, the easy introduction ones, but it gets really complex really fast for sure. Um, and if you're, if you're someone who likes puzzles, who likes matching things, who would know I want things to be in this shape and I could match this color with that color, then that's a good project for you. Um, but not everybody likes puzzles, and that's okay. Eterna is an awesome project, but maybe, you know, you need to get outside for a little bit. You need to go walk around. Let's say you've done a few hours of Eterna, and now you're ready to do Debris Tracker. You're ready to go outside on your walk. Um, debris Tracker, it used to be called Marine Debris Tracker, but they broadened it to handle all types of debris anywhere. You don't have to be on the coast. And it's a project that's really focused on plastic pollution. And they have support from NOAA um, and the National Oceanic um, Administration, as well as um, National Geographic and some other sources like UGA, um, the University of Georgia. Um, Marine Debris Tracker, also known as Debris Tracker, is a great project. Um, but I'm going to let this video introduce it to you really quickly. We're so excited you're interested in Marine Debris Tracker. My name is Katherine Youngblood and I'm a research engineer with Jan Beck Research Group at the University of Georgia New Materials Institute. We study upstream solutions to ocean plastic pollution. With an estimated 8 million metric tons of plastic entering our ocean ecosystems every year and having devastating effects on ocean organisms that accidentally consume it, this is a problem that's growing bigger every year. We're passionate about preventing plastic pollution in our oceans and waterways, which is why we created the Marine Debris Tracker app with help from NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, almost eight years ago. With the Marine Debris Tracker app, thousands of citizen scientists from countries around the world have tracked over 1.5 million items of litter so far. Citizen scientists just like you are helping us create a bigger picture of the plastic pollution problem by tracking trash wherever you are, in cities, near rivers, out in the mountains, or cleaning up a beach. Thank you for tracking and for helping to protect our oceans and waterways around the world. We're happy to have you on board. So much fun! I'm just jamming out to this music now. Um, so the whole premise of this, and this is um, a screenshot from National Geographic materials they made for Debris Tracker, is they want to help the planet. 
Um, so there are lots of different ways that you can collect data with um, Debris Tracker, but um, regular monitoring is a big plus. So if you're able to like go walking in your neighborhood regularly and use the Debris Tracker app, that would be a huge help for them. Um, and you, you let them know, like, is there a lot of debris? Is there only a little bit? Is there none at all? Um, even if there's no debris, that's an important thing to note. Um, you could put in a zero count. And that will tell them like, hey, this area is in pretty good shape. It's not contributing to the plastic pollution issue. And you can track any type of debris. Um, the NOAA list on the website has, is pretty comprehensive, but they have different sub investigations that different people have created in different places. Like I know Raleigh, North Carolina, they just launched a, um, a sub investigation and they added some debris items that they really wanted to track. But the NOAA list has tons of things like soda cans. Um, they have like those little plastic rings that you see things in, like all sorts of different types of debris listed that you can track. And um, if you want to work in a team, maybe with your family and friends, that's a great idea too. Um, just make sure, of course, you're socially distanced and observing the proper guidelines. Um, and of course, you can do a cleanup at the same time. So not only are you tracking plastic pollution and logging data of the debris that you see, but you're also taking action to pick it up and dispose of it properly um, according to your local area's guidelines. Um, and this is what the app looks like. It's super simple. Um, it's available on Apple and on Android, and you can start tracking right away. And luckily, this is a SciStarter affiliate. So all of this, as long as you know, of course, you use the same email address all across the board, all of this will track in your SciStarter dashboard. Um, so we have Catherine Gaves. So who you just heard from in that last video is Catherine Youngblood um, from the Debris Tracker team. She did a Q&A with us at SciStarter a while back. I wanted to play a little bit from it for, the, um, for you right now to hear from Catherine again and, and some more detail, because that's the beauty of an event like this. We're able to dig a little bit deeper with your community, with the St. Charles, Illinois Library community to learn about these projects. Um, so I'm gonna click play and uh, we're gonna speed up a little bit. So let's exit that. One second, so let's go full screen. So we're gonna start where Catherine started us. Right here will be good. Thanks for everybody who's tuned in. Um, just gonna give a quick overview on what the project is about. So my name is Catherine Youngblood. I'm a research engineer at the University of Georgia, and I'm also the citizen science director for Debris Tracker. So um, I get to research plastic pollution in the field and then also get to help other people collect data on plastic pollution as well. So Debris Tracker is a project that was developed in 2010. So we've been around a while. Um, we were developed in collaboration with the University of Georgia and NOAA. And now we're lucky enough to be powered by Morgan Stanley. So grateful to them for their funding and support of our project. So Debris Tracker is an app that is used to collect geospatial litter data. We have people who collect all around the world. Um, we have a model where we work with both individuals and organizations. So if you've ever opened up the app, you'll notice that there is a section of a bunch of different lists and all of those are customized lists um, for different organizations around the world, like nonprofits, educators, um, research institutions. So we have a lot of a lot of different partners we work with um, and people uh, we, we host customized lists so that allows for um, us to change the litter items people are collecting based on wherever in the world they are. So we have people collecting inland and people collecting on the coast and people collecting as they sail across the ocean, a really big variety of where people are collecting data. Um, so we, those, those individual organizations are using that data for, you know, research, for policy innovation, uh, for to empower them in their local community co to collect data on what's there, where they are, um, and empower them to inform upstream solutions that are appropriate for wherever they are in the world. Um, but then on our side, we're also, you know, creating this really big overview picture of plastic pollution. So we have data tracked in over 92 countries around the world, um, over 2.5 million items to date. So we have both of these goals of trying to um, empower local organizations to be able to collect data on what's in their area, and then also creating this really big global picture, um, which we're excited to have your help contributing to. 
Um, I'm not going to go through a full training on how to use the app today just because it's pretty self explanatory and I don't want to take up too much time, but I want to make sure that you guys are aware that we have a lot of great resources out there on how to use the app if you have any specific questions. Um, on our website here, you there's a getting started guide that goes through a really detailed kind of shot by shot. Here's what every single button does. Here's what to do if you run into any issues. So that's a great resource. Um, we've also we use the app in our own research, including on last year's National Geographic Sita Source Expedition in India and Bangladesh along the Ganges River. We collected, I think, over 85,000 uh, litter items that we recorded uh, geolocation points for along the river. So really amazing data set. And then we also got to work with local communities and train schools and um, just local nonprofits, local engaged citizens on how to use the app. So as part of that, National Geographic helped us create some really awesome uh, educational resources that are available on their debris tracker website. That link is right there in case you need it. Um, but that includes a, a getting started guide that kind of goes through the basics of the app, as well as this plastic pollution action journal um, that's really geared towards students and kind of walking them through the way we think about plastic pollution. So um, what's there? Why is it there? And how did it get there? So kind of walking through these steps of how to think about plastic data and how to think about uh, collecting data and what questions you can answer with that data. So yeah, that's a, a really quick overview. I put my contact info here. Yeah, and Catherine's super friendly. So if you all tweeted at the Debris Tracker account or tagged them on Facebook or even just emailed her, I know she'd always be happy to get in touch with you. But that gave you the kind of upper level overview of the Debris Tracker project. Um, so I am going to um, take you back to Kimmy's list now, because I think that's such a great like grounding place for us. It's scistar.org forward slash list forward slash 183. And the two projects we reviewed today, Eterna and Debris Tracker, are both listed here. Um, and Kimmy's able to keep track of those and review some stats. And those stats are private to Kimmy. So if you join through her list, um, you know, it's not going to be shared out to the entire world. It's just from with her as the volunteer coordinator. Um, and with a SciStarter account, you have to be over the age of 13 to have an account for privacy reasons. Um, but if you have students you want to participate with who are under 13, just make sure that you as the um, supervising adult do that with them. Or if you're watching this and you're a student and you're under 13, just like make sure that you're doing these projects alongside an educator or a trusted adult in your life. Um, and then tomorrow, just as a sneak preview, we're going to be reviewing stall catchers and IC change. Um, that being said, um, I also wanted to point you all to the Field Guide to Citizen Science. Both um, the projects um, that we've been learning about in this series, um, they're reviewed in here alongside a lot of other different citizen science projects. The Field Guide to Citizen Science is SciStarter's book. Um, if you're not at the St. Charles Library, it's also probably at a library near you. I know a lot of e-reading resources like Hoopla and Libby um, have hosted this Field Guide book. So if you're looking for another way to get introduced to citizen science, I'd give this book a try. Um, but if nothing else today, I hope that this event has really shown you that um, you can do citizen science, you can do it in a way that is flexible with your lifestyle, um, and you can uh, do it with your community. And I think the St. Charles Public Library is such a great example of um, doing citizen science with a community coming together to actually do it. Um, so today, you know, we went through the steps to do some training for Eterna, and we made some contributions there, and we learned about how to download the Debris Tracker app and how to log litter there um, to help document the global problem of plastic pollution. Um, and then tomorrow, we're going to literally do stall catchers and IC change together. I'm going to take you outside on my phone and do IC change with you, and then I'm going to do stall catchers and have you all vote on the different stalled and flowing blood vessels for an Alzheimer's research project. Um, and we'll get more into that in tomorrow's event. Um, we have a survey at the end of this event that we'd love for you to fill out. I'm going to put the link in the chat as well. Um, this survey is, um, it just helps us know how we're doing. If you have any suggestions for us, we always take those into account and take them very seriously. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and give you the link to the survey for this event. And it looks like we had a question in the chat. Um, Jay wants to know, is it possible to replay this session to share with a local library director to implement projects in their library? Jay, of course. Oh my gosh. We were live streaming this to YouTube, so the recording is already available for you. 
Um, and the good news is I'm also, as Kimmy knows, I love planning events with libraries. Um, so if your local library director wanted to do a similar event with us, we'd love it. The more people doing citizen science, the merrier. Um, someone's asked, when did citizen science begin the first project? So believe it or not, there's been citizen science for as long as science has existed. Um, Karen Cooper from NC State University has a really good book about the history of citizen science. Um, but the first ever citizen science project, many people point to, um, it was in, um, in England in the 1700s where people were tracking tides. They were tracking uh, the ocean. Um, and it was people from all over England submitting data to a researcher. Um, so citizen science has been around for a really, really long time. Um, but SciStarter itself has been around for, for quite a few years. Um, I, it was founded by Darlene Cavalier. Um, and, you know, I, after, I think in like 2006 or so, um, it came from her master's thesis. And then um, now she's a professor of practice at Arizona State University and the founder of the Science Cheerleaders and all other sorts of great organizations. But SciStarter is, um, Darlene is our fearless leader and created SciStarter as a way to connect you to all sorts of different citizen science projects. That was a key problem she identified. She realized that um, there are so many citizen science projects out there at all these different universities and organizations and federal agencies and, and uh, so much more. Everybody kind of had a citizen science project, but they all weren't in one place. It was really hard to find them. And if you like citizen science, you usually like to do multiple projects. So maybe you like doing Eterna. You're like, I really enjoyed this game. Gee, I wish I could discover other citizen science projects easily. So that's where SciStarter comes into play. It's searchable, so you can go into our project finder and search by topic or even search by activity. If you want to search for projects to do at home or projects you can do on a hike, it makes it easy for um, leaders like Kimmy to collect projects together and help keep track of that participation and reward her volunteers. Um, and it helps the project leaders because it gives them the platform to get the word out about their different projects. Uh, and Kimmy said the St. Charles Public Library has the field guide to citizen science. That's right. So if you all want to keep reading, you can um, check it out from the St. Charles Public Library. Um, and if you all, um, now that we're at the close of our event, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. If you all have questions and you want to speak, feel free to raise your hand with the Zoom function um, or just put in the chat, unmute me or something like that. Um, but I'll, I'll pass the mic to Kimmy really quickly and get questions now that you've heard all this stuff today. No, yeah, thank you very much for all the information. I know that for me, I have two small kids and we've been doing the debris tracker um, and then we've been doing one of the, the other ones that you're going to be going over tomorrow. So we've been having a good time with it. So I think it's a great family activity. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to put the link in the chat to tomorrow's event in case you all want to go ahead and register on Zoom. I'm also going to make sure we have the link in the chat to the survey. Um, I'm trying to think of common questions we get that you all might be interested in. Um, one question we get a lot is um, how can we trust the data? And um, the answer is like projects like Eterna and Debris Tracker, they have processes in place in the back end to help validate that data. Um, so let's say for Eterna, you design kind of like a bad puzzle. It's not particularly good. Um, it wouldn't make a good medicine. Um, you haven't practiced that much. You, you just didn't make a good one. You don't have to worry about hurting the research because Eterna, they vote on the puzzles they want to uh, move to the next stage. So you can kind of participate without worrying about hurting anything. And same with Debris Tracker. Um, that one's not too hard to mess up because you know, you're know you tracking litter. Um, it's pretty clear what litter you're seeing and what what things you can click on the app to log what you saw. Um, but let's say you um, submit an observation of your feet. Um, Debris Tracker goes through and checks it and they'd know like, hey, feet aren't litter and they would throw it out. Um, so you don't have to, and pretty much every citizen science project has some sort of data quality mechanism built in. So you can participate without being worried. Um, and the good thing about citizen science is project leaders um, are pretty clear about the protocols or the steps that you need to follow to give a valid um, observation or to participate in a way that's helpful. Um, so as long as you follow those steps, you're golden. You don't really need any other type of training. I'm trying to think of other questions that people tend to ask us. Um, one question I get a lot is why am I involved in this work and what my background is? Um, and to tell you the truth, I'm a citizen scientist as well. Um, 
I studied Chinese language and uh, European history in college. And I actually got involved in all this by doing some citizen science about monarch butterflies, helping to track their migrations. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. So I started volunteering with SciStarter. And uh, eventually as I was in grad school and studying um, environmental policy, uh, it worked its way into a full-time job and here I am today. Um, so you, you really don't need any type of special background to be a citizen scientist. You can do it at all different ages. And at SciStarter, we have a bunch of different programs, everything from a corporate volunteer program to Verizon to a Girl Scouts badge um, through this Think Like a Citizen Scientist Girl Scouts journey. So citizen science is very diverse and you can participate um, at all different stages of your life. Um, if you have any other questions, put those in the chat now, or if you want us to unmute you and you have a, like uh, you want to engage in dialogue with us, you're welcome to. I'm going to go ahead and put the YouTube recording in the chat because I know Jay mentioned that he wanted to share that with um, his local library. Um, so I'm going to put the YouTube link in case you want to share it. Someone asked, how do we help a library like St. Charles? Um, place the SciStarter program on their website and Zoom sessions to introduce residents and students to check out the kits. That's a great idea, Jay. Um, there, are, I mean, it depends on what your like, what works best for your community. I'll put a link to our SciStarter library resources page where we outline a few different methods for libraries to get involved. Because some libraries will create kits, you know, like they'll be like, here's a night sky meter to help measure light pollution. Um, you know, they'll just like put together like kits you can check out from the library. Whereas other libraries, you know, they want to be more online, they'll just, they'll make lists like Kimmy did, and they'll make it easy for their patrons to find things like Eterna that they can play from home and get service time for. And then maybe they can plug in, um, you know, things like the Think like the, the Field Guide to Citizen Science book. Um, I've seen libraries do book displays of different books in citizen science. We have a few book lists on our library resources page if you wanted to start there. Um, there are all sorts of different options. Kimmy, do you have thoughts on that? Well, I think also to how Jay's asking how to get residents and students interested, you know, is I think just start projects, find something that interests you and talk about it, you know, talk to other people about it, share. I know that when I started this, I got so excited with my kids and I just started, you know, telling, you know, other people that I knew and friends about it. So I think that's a big way, too, is just to get involved with the different projects and tell your family and friends. That's such a good point, Kimmy. You have to do what excites you. And um, I know some libraries, like I'll put a link in the chat to the Crowd the Tap project. This is a project that libraries where maybe there are water quality issues in the area or people might have lead pipes. Um, they pick that project to do with their patrons because they know that's an issue that resonates with their community. Our, um, some urban areas, for example, they may really grapple with light pollution. It could be disrupting sleep or circadian rhythms. So the library in that area may choose to lead their patrons in the Globe at Night project. Um, so that's such a good point, Kimmy. Do what excites you, do what matters to you, find a project and just get started. And um, at SciStarter, we're always happy to do Zoom events with libraries. Um, so you're more than welcome to get in touch with us and we can plan something with you. Any other questions from folks before we go? Well, if there aren't any other questions, um, I just want to thank Kimmy again and thank all of you for being here and for caring about citizen science. Kimmy, oh, we have one more question from Jim. Jim wants to know, just like every organization, libraries may be worried about funding. Does citizen science require much investment for the, from the library? Kimmy, I'll let you take this question. No, I mean, we, we no cost. <laughs> yeah, at all. It's been amazing. It's really amazing how much or how um, developed the resources is that SciStarter has, you know, shared with us um, to help us get this program going. So there's a ton of library resources that they have put together and it's available for us. Yeah, and at SciStarter, you might be wondering who pays for this whole website. Um, we get support from a number of different sources. So like the National Science Foundation, um, the National Library of Medicine support a number of our library programs. Um, we're able to develop three free tools like the create a list feature um, through support through different like um, uh, things like Arizona State University and institutions like North Carolina State University have helped us um, create these 
these tools that we're able to provide to the community as a public service. Um, someone asked, is the City Nature Challenge used in a lot of cities and do libraries start this kind of project? Uh, people love the City Nature Challenge. So for those who don't know, the City Nature Challenge is basically a competition on iNaturalist every year um, where people try to classify um, and document as many plants and animal species as possible. And all the cities are in a friendly competition with each other. So like Seattle versus, you know, Cape Town, South Africa, like you can register your city and get involved. I recommend going to the City Nature Challenge's website for that. And iNaturalist is a SciStarter affiliate. So if you want to track people's contributions in their SciStarter dashboards as part of like a library program, for example, you could definitely do that. Uh, any closing words for us, Kemi? No, thank you so much. Great. Oh, I Erica's on board. So Erica, she's from the Kane County Forest Preserve. So it's great to have her on board. And I know she has some programs over there. Erica, nice to meet you. I hope that um, if you ever want to work with us or do a, a citizen, you have some citizen science programs, you're welcome to list those on SciStarter events. I'll put the link in the chat to add things to SciStarter. Um, and awesome. That's so cool. Oh, so people join tomorrow. Yay, come tomorrow. Jay wants to know, where do we find other campus and city libraries um, do you recommend? Um, so Erica says, I want to talk to our volunteer coordinator. Very cool. Let's keep this conversation going. And Jay, um, if you are looking for the City Nature Challenge, just go to that website to see what cities and um, organizers have signed up. Um, but otherwise, if you go to the SciStarter events page, and I'll put that in the chat, a lot of people will add their library events or their, um, their City Nature Challenge events to that event page. That's a good database to look for events that you can get involved with. I'm checking to see if there are any other last minute questions. All right, I think we had all our questions. Kimmy, I will see you tomorrow. All right, thank you. Bye.